Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is professional real estate investor David Campbell, and we've got a fantastic program for you today. Joining us from Cox Premier Properties is my personal property manager and friend, Jason Cox. Hello, everyone. So we've got a great program here for you today. Our very important points that we're going to cover are metrics of success for property management. How do you know your manager is doing a good job? We're going to talk about why your property manager is the very number one most important person on your investing team. We're going to talk about what's reasonable and not reasonable to expect your property manager to do for you. We're going to show you some warning signs that may be a clue that your property manager is not doing uh, a great job for you. We're going to talk about how to interview for a property manager, and we're going to talk about what to do if for some reason you get into a property management relationship that didn't work out and you need to uh, fire your property manager, how to handle that situation. And if you hang into the end, we're going to give away four property management secrets to make you more money as an investor. A little bit about myself. I am the founder of Hassle Free Cash Flow Investing. I'm a real estate investor, developer, broker. What our business does is connect people like you to financial ideas that promote prosperity. We do broker properties, we develop properties. And if you like what you see here today, I really encourage you to visit our website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. Jason uh, and Melinda Cox are the owners and managers of Cox Premier Properties from Dallas, Texas, and they do a great job managing property. And I uh, encourage you to visit their website. And one of the big clues that a manager does a good job or that they take their job seriously is that they're a member of the National Association of Residential Property Managers, or NARPO for short and uh, Cox Premier Properties are members. So let's get the legal stuff out of the way. This is not legal tax or investment advice. This information is educational only. There, even though Jason uh, is a licensee and I am licensed as a real estate broker, there's no agency created between us and you by being on this call. Um, Jason and I are gonna talk about a lot of things. It's just our opinion. There's no guarantee that what we say is accurate. And it ultimately, consult your own legal tax and investment advisor before making any uh, decisions. So here's a basic premise, which is we all want to make more money with less invested. And the way that we can do that is by making more profit. That's good. But what if we made the same amount of profit with less money? That would be good. What if we made the same amount of profit with less time? That would be good. And with less hassle, well, that would be good too. So really what we're after is not just how to make the most money or even the highest rate of return, but how to make the highest rate of return when it's adjusted for the time and the hassle that go into making that decision. Here's just a really brief picture on how we make money as a real estate investor. And it's a life cycle. And so you start with the property and you lease the property. And then your tenant goes to work and their tenant makes money. The tenant pays you the money. And then you use some of that money to pay the expenses like the taxes and the insurance and you pay your bank and then you get to keep some money. And that's what we like. That is the life cycle of real estate investing. When your tenant disappears, unfortunately, or stops paying or loses their job, or one of those parts of this life cycle are broken, either you're don't get the money, you're not rented, your tenant loses their job, they don't have the money to pay you. Unfortunately, as the landlord, your expenses and your mortgage keep going. So it's really, really important that we figure out how to maintain this healthy life cycle of collecting money from rents and keeping your employer you know, happy. So one of the fundamental questions is, who is your tenant? You know, what kind of tenant are you after? And, you know, I have Fortune 500 companies as my tenants. I um, would love to get more uh, federal government uh, type tenants. Those would be great, you know, but I also have properties like the one that you see here where the, the toe sucking tenant with, uh, you know, the sloppy house. 
And the magic of being a landlord is you get to choose. I mean, you can kind of guesstimate at the beginning what your tenant is going to be like by the property that you choose. And the reason that investing has such high returns and you hear stories, horror stories of people saying, oh my goodness, I bought a property and it went so badly because they didn't really have the idea that real estate investing is a business and an investment, right? So business produces income and investment produces income. Businesses have expenses, but an investment doesn't have an expense. Like if you bought got Apple stock as an investment, well, Apple, the company has stock, but your share in that company doesn't have expenses. Real estate has expenses. And what we're trying to show with this slide here is that real estate is both. It's an investment and a business. And the question is, can real estate be hassle-free? Can I have it be passive? Do I need to interact with people? Do I have to invest time? And the answer is maybe. And the way that you can get all of those time the, the interaction with people, making it passive, you know, not requiring specialized skills and understanding tenant landlord law and understanding how to fix toilets and things like that. The idea is if you outsource all of those things that a professional property manager can do, then your investment can be passive. It can be hassle free. Real estate by itself is not necessarily hassle-free. You know, real estate is actually a pain in the neck, but it can be passive and hassle-free if you have the right management team, if you're buying the kinds of properties that attract the kinds of tenants that would appeal to uh, appeal to you and appeal to your, your um, personal investment philosophy. So one of the first metrics of success is making sure that your alignment of vision, that if you're expecting that, that really happy, pretty family in your property and you buy something in a blue collar, low income neighborhood, it might not be a pretty happy family, right? Or if you buy a studio apartment, you're probably gonna get a lot of single people, a lot of itinerant people. If you buy a commercial property, then great, you've got a commercial tenant and that's, that's a great thing, easier to manage. So we're gonna be talking with Jason about what makes for a good manager and I had this conversation with Jason and really trying to say, how do we quantify what a good manager is? It's easy to say, I want a good manager. Well, what does that look like? So Jason, when someone has a, a, a professional residential manager in place, um, how quickly should they expect to get their uh, money from, from their manager? Well, typically, they should expect to get their funds no later than the 10th of the month, uh, providing we don't have a, you know, a crazy month like with a holiday weekend at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, before we go too much farther in the program, I just want to encourage everyone or thank you for attending live. And this is a live event. And if you do have questions, you can use that chat box as part of the go to webinar control panel. Just go ahead and type your questions in. If we can get to them in a time, you know, as we're going, we will. And if for some reason we don't get to your question, uh, we will have a Q&A section at the end and we'll be sure to follow up with you via email if we don't actually get to your call, uh, call today. So when we're working with our uh, property manager, if our property manager, Jason, if you know that I expect my money by the 10th and it doesn't come in by the 15th, Am I going to be a happy customer? No, you're not. And so the idea is if my if Jason knows what I expect, he can deliver on that. If for some reason I was expecting to get my rent by the 5th of the month and Jason was happy that he got it to me by the 10th of the month, there might be a disconnect in our relationship where – I'm expecting something that he didn't know, and because he didn't know, he didn't deliver on that expectation, and then there becomes a conflict. So a lot of what we're talking about today is really adjusting your expectations with your property manager, making sure that your property manager communicates with you on what they can reasonably provide. So Jason, do you have any thoughts for us on this particular slide and what is reasonable um, 
communicate, how do you communicate with a new owner on whether, uh, what the metrics of success would look like? Well, I just believe that you should, you know, sit down with each of your owners and go over how you run your business as a property manager. And it's ultimately, once they have that information, you know, it's ultimately up to them if, you know, they feel that based on what you've told them that they're the, that you're the right property manager for them. So, for example, when I went to hire Jason as my property manager, I think he does a great job. He came as a referral to me from uh, a friend and client of mine who's been with our company for years. I said, Jason, what I'm really looking for, it's important to me that I can read and understand your reports. So, Jason, before I make a decision to hire you, please send me your property management reports so I can see what I'm going to get. What that did is it created an expectation to Jason. He knows that I'm going to read what he sends me and it better be legible and in a way that I understand. Otherwise, he won't get my, my book of business. So the other thing I was talking to Jason about is vacancy loss. And I want my properties full 100% of the time. But that isn't reasonable. Right, I, I would love 100% occupancy, but that's not reasonable. And so I build into my uh, performance a vacancy loss assumption. And what I'm looking for is saying, Jason, tell me, you know, is it reasonable that my property would be rented at the market rate of occupancy? And Jason, how would you figure out what that would be? In order to figure out the market rate, we would run your property or run that particular area on the multiple listing service and see what the other properties within the last six months have rented for. And then, you know, similar comparing apples to apples uh, as far as the property. Um, and then from that, we would be able to determine what that property should rent for and how long it should take it to rent. Mm -hmm. And so the important part is I asked Jason, how would you answer this question? And he gave me his metrics of success, right? He told me how he was going to solve that, that answer. So at any time I can call him up and say, look, you're using the methodology that you explain, right? Using the MLS and collecting the data, we are, or we are not achieving our, metric of success, which is hitting a certain occupancy rate, right? And so Jason and I kind of worked out this slide between him as my manager and me as the owner. And these are the things that we can check off to see, is Jason doing a good, a good job? And it was a very uh, a good process for us to go through. And this is going to be different for you and your manager. So when we're setting our management relationship up for success, I really believe that the manager's job is to educate me as the owner on what, how my property can perform. And once I've communicated or not communicated, but the, the, my manager and I understand what success looks like and we've quantified that, then I want the manager to help me stay in touch with the market. Jason, can you give some thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, anytime, let's just say the property uh, is in the beginning stages, as we discussed before, you know, it's, you know, it's vacant. It's just been turned over. We uh, use the MLS to determine what the best, uh, the best rate of rent should be. And then we put it on the market for that. But moving further down the line, say the tenant is up for renewal. Well, you don't want to just say, okay, well, we'll renew you at the same rate. A good property manager is going to pull up the MLS again or whatever uh, they use in their area and take another look at the market because a lot can change over the course of a year lease. A lot can change over the course of a six-month lease. Uh, and then determine if there is a rent increase that needs to be put in place.
or potentially a, a rent decrease. I mean, I would love it if rents always went up, but sometimes they, they don't for whatever the, the reason is. And so by being in touch with my manager, I can empower Jason to set the market rent. The place where a lot of investors get in trouble is they say, well, my mortgage is a thousand, so I need you to rent it for 1100. And how, you know, you don't even know what the property is like, right? The rent might be 800, the rent might be 1500 for the owner to base their rent on their need is false economy, right? The market sets the rent range. And so using your property manager, they can help you determine what that rent range uh, will be. So this was a fun slide to, to put together in talking about Jason's uh, you know, stories working with unreasonable owners. And very admittedly, when I was a, uh, a new investor, and even now as an investor, I've got very high expectations. And I want to make sure that I'm being a reasonable owner. And uh, so let's just talk about, uh, Jason, share some of your thoughts with, about working with unreasonable owners and why some of these bullet points are unreasonable. Well, wanting your rent to be paid on the first of every month, uh, it's impossible. Just through the dynamics of the of the transaction, the tenant has to, you know, a lot of tenants will mail their rent or they'll do a ACH transfer. So there's, you know, there's a timeline in there, and that's why we say we, you know, we want to get your rent to you. Our goal is to get it to you by the tenth of every month. That allows for tenants to pay at different times and for different financial institutions to, you know, get the money transferred or for the postal service to get it to us and then it, for it to clear our bank. Um, the rent paid directly to the owner, that would just be an accounting nightmare. There's, there would be just no way to track that. And here's, here's why, because let's say my property manager's job is to get the rent from the tenant. And if the tenant doesn't pay, I want my property manager to notice, not me. And if the rent goes to me, I would have to call the manager and say, look, my I didn't get the rent from the tenant. Go do something about it. And what an extra unnecessary step that would be. So a lot of these bullet points on what makes an owner an unreasonable owner it's where the owner is stepping in to actually do parts of the property manager's job for them. And it's kind of like saying uh, to a car mechanic, hey, I would like to uh, hold the wrench and have you turn it. Right. Well, that's just cumbersome. You, you, why not just, just have the, the mechanic do his job? Right. So some of these things that and, and through experience owners come up with, like I want my property inspected every 30 days. Well, what an annoyance to the tenant. It's not that the property manager is unwilling to look at your property. It's just that if every 30 days a stranger came into my home and looked around, I wouldn't want to live there very long. The tenants want their privacy. And the property manager's job is to kind of look for signs that say there maybe is a need to go inside, right? Looking at the exteriors are uh, is a clue of how the inside looks. If the rent starts being slow, well, then that's a clue that there might be something going on in the, the property, uh, maybe a loss of a job or something like that. And the other thing is a lot of landlords really want to meet every tenant. And I think that's a terrible idea. I never want to know who my tenant is. And it's kind of a, uh, a cold way to think about it, but my tenants are people and my property is a business and it's really tough to kind of separate yourself because I'm a very compassionate person. And if I had my tenant call up and say, you know, David, I lost my job and my uh, child passed away and I really need uh, more time paying the rent. And that is just a terrible, terrible situation to be in because as a human being, I want to say, of course, what a horrible situation. I would never want that. You know, I, I can only imagine how terrible you feel. Take your time, right? Well, my job isn't to provide welfare to this person. I, I can be empathic, but 
isn't my job to pay their bills and to be their own source of uh, personal income. And so by separating myself from the humanness of who the, who the tenant is, then the professional property manager gets to say, I'm sorry, Miss Tenant, your, your problem is unfortunate, but I'm just the messenger. My job is to enforce the lease. And we have an agreement. You pay rent or you move out. And if you'd like some help moving, perhaps we can help you, uh, you know, arrange to get a property that you can afford or to move out um, or, or work out some type of a different payment plan, et cetera. But by removing myself from that personal connection with the tenant, it allows you one to scale to be larger and two to really make your your investments hassle free right the the tenants are the messy part of investing and it's just unfortunate um that tenants have lives and, and i just want to remove myself from that that kind of situation do you have thoughts on that jason well, absolutely uh, owners should as you said should never meet their tenants. Uh, that is absolutely what your property manager is for, is to take the human aspect out of the equation, as cold as that sounds. But you cannot effectively run your business synonymous with your property. I mean, you can't. Uh, if you throw the human equation in there and become sympathetic uh, to you know, whatever, um, you know, they throw at you. And I mean, you know, and what's sad is a lot of owners will get played for lack of a better word. I mean, we've had tenants that I didn't know you could have that many grandmothers pass away in one year, but mm -hmm. I didn't know you could have that many grandmothers for that matter. But I mean, you see, hear what I'm, see what I'm saying, what I'm saying here. It's, uh, it's, you don't, it's just a bad plan for an owner to have direct contact with their tenant. I, I remember when I was a brand new investor and I was managing my own property. Um, I, I had a particular tenant that went six months without paying their rent and it was my own fault. I just was slow to start the eviction process. And when we finally evicted the tenant, she had nicer furniture and newer clothes and newer everything than I did. And I, I just kind of thought, this is crazy. I've been paying this woman's housing for the last six months and she's got all of this, you know, ni nice stuff. And so that's where um, it's really key just to have a lease, have a business agreement, make it business. Don't make it personal with your, your tenants. Um, there is a video recording being made of today's presentation. And if you register for today's event, we'll make sure that you get a copy of that video as well as a copy of the slides. So why the property manager is the most important person on your team? I like when I go to a new market to start my due diligence with the property manager, right? More important than the property is the person available to meet and greet my tenants, to help me avoid lawsuits, to help my property stay in compliance with codes. I own properties that I have not been to in five years. And the only person who's been to that property is my manager. And I'm comfortable with that because I keep on top of my managers and I have good relationships with my managers. And the manager's job is to isolate the owner from hassle. The manager's job is to allow me economies of scale or leverage with my time. My job is to run my business and my manager's job is to manage my properties. Jason? I couldn't have said it better. That's <laughs> absolutely what we're here for is to take, take the load off of the owner and do our job so that owning property does become as hassle-free as possible. Yep, that's great. So when uh, people are interviewing for a manager, it's kind of like interviewing for a business partner or a date, right? You're, you're deciding on the first date with your property manager, which is your interview, is this someone that you want to jump into a long-term committed relationship with, right? You're not quite getting married, 
but you're deciding to move in together and to start uh, sharing toothbrushes. It's that kind of a personal relationship. So Jason, can you talk about what are some of the key questions that would be important for people to ask a residential property manager? Well, you definitely want to meet the broker. That is the person that is ultimately responsible for the property management company and how they perform. Uh, being a member of NORPM is very important. Uh, that will tell you how legitimate the company is. Being on the MLS, that's going to let you know because you have to pay to be on it first of all, and it's not it's not uh, inexpensive. But that's going to let you know that your property is being marketed in the most effective way possible, at least in our area here in Texas. That's a big point Insurance. because if the broker is not a member of the multiple listing service, then your property is not going to be exposed on the multiple listing service, and that's a in some areas that's a really big deal. Uh, for rentals, right? If you go to Realtor.com and you search for property, the only way to get a property on Realtor.com is to have it in the multiple listing service. And it, as Jason said, it's it's not cheap. So if your property manager doesn't pay for that service, you're not going to get that benefit. So these are some great questions to uh, ask your manager. And these days, technology is such an important part of the management experience. I would really focus a lot of my questions around how the manager is implementing technology to make his job easier, which makes my job uh, easier as well. And some of the, um, the key points that I, I think are absolutely number one are, um, the number of units under management and the vacancy in their overall portfolio and the types of units that make up that portfolio. I want my property to be relatively consistent with the makeup of that manager's portfolio. For example, let's say the manager says, I'm very experienced. I have 150 units under management, which is a good number, right? That, that's enough to create a full-time income for a property manager. And I say, great, that's a good check, check the box. Well, what kinds of units are they? Well, they're all C-class ghetto properties. And well, I've got a brand new super luxury house on the other side of town. That's a different type of customer service experience. It's a different type of vendor expectation, et cetera. So I'm, I want to make sure that the, um, I'm gonna ask the manager, one of the leading questions is, if you were going to buy a property in this area, what kind of property would you like to manage? Wow, Jason, you know, how many times do people say, what property would you like to manage? You, you remember, you're the only person that's ever asked me that and it threw me for a loop. But yeah, that's, that's a great question to ask your, uh, to ask your uh, property manager or your potential property manager. Yeah, because the answer that comes out is could be all over the map. I mean, they might say, I really enjoy cleaning human hair out of toilets. So give me the ugliest, dirtiest property possible. And or they might say, I really like, you know, four bedroom homes because the families live there. And I like working with families because they tend to be longer term. And as a manager, here's an interesting, you know, uh, paradigm shift to break. Jason, do you make more money when, and I'm going to say money per hour, like which is more, which would you prefer, right? Spending a lot of time and leasing a property and making 50 to 60% of the first month's rent or doing nothing and getting eight to 10% of the month's rent. Doing nothing and getting eight to 10%. Yes. So your manager does a lot of work finding the right tenant for you. And once that tenant is in, the manager's goal is that tenant never calls, that they pay their rent on time. They don't call and ask for repairs. And they basically do 
not a whole lot, and they get paid 8 to 10% of the rent. The reason you have a manager is because when they do call, they put in so much more work than what that 8 to 10% pays. You know, For example, um, maybe you've got a $500 a month rental, and the management fee is $50 a month or 10%. You're hoping that that tenant doesn't call, but when they do call, it's probably going to take you three or four hours to fix their problem. And then you're only making, you know, 12 or 15 bucks an hour. And a property manager wants to make more than that. So they want to set you up for success um, by getting that that residual income, just like you, you want that residual income. Um, Jason, talk about, you know, what your company does to ensure that your clients have a good um, management experience and, and what kinds of questions would you want people to ask you so that you could show off, you know, how good of a job you do? Well, we, we definitely want, you know, the proper expectations set up front so that, you know, everyone understands what's expected from, from each other. Uh, you know, I would definitely want people, potential clients, owners to, Ask me, you know, wh how does my company ensure, or, or what steps do we take to find their tenant and make sure that we're doing everything possible to place a a good tenant in that property? Uh, you know, it's just very important to put tenants through a screening process to. To look at their background, look at their income. I mean, put them under a microscope because it's the property manager's job to treat your investment as if it were their own, and that's our that's our policy, and that that should be every property manager's policy. And and if you if you start out with a tenant on the right foot, you're you're more likely to be set up for success with that tenant. I mean, nobody has a crystal ball, but it, it, there are things that you can do uh, or ask of your property manager to put yourself in the best possible position for success with any particular tenant. Mm -hmm. The questions that we have on the slide really seem like they should be obvious, but they aren't. Not all property managers have after hours emergency response, right? And not all managers have a privacy policy for your essential documents. Your, your property manager has your social security number because they have to file a tax form um, for you, right? They've got tax reporting obligations and They've also got your tenants' personal information. They have a copies of your keys. And are they having a good policy to separ separate the keys from the address that go with those keys so that if someone were to break in and steal the, the keys, they wouldn't necessarily have instant access to your property. There's a lot of best practices that go into property management. And I think it's the hardest job in real estate. And I you know, sometimes we'll really look at investing heavier in a market when I find a good manager that I want to expand my relationship with. Unfortunately, not all property managers do a good job. And some property managers are unethical. And it's really unfortunate that, you know, in, in business, there are people who do it ethically and people who don't do it ethically. And when you're new at investing, it's easy to get taken advantage of and it's easy to get taken advantage of by your tenant. It's easy to get taken advantage of by your property manager. Sometimes your property manager takes advantage of you, you know, ethically, but by not meeting your expectations, right? If the manager doesn't know what your investment goals are and you haven't had a conversation about what metrics of success look like for you as a manager, sometimes the manager could very innocently think they're helping, but simultaneously hurting. You know, for example, um, I had uh, a manager who, um, or my AC broke down and the manager went and spent $100 uh, fixing it. And that was good, right? 
But what I didn't communicate to my manager was, you know, this AC is on its last legs anyway. The next time it breaks down, don't patch it. I want you to replace it with a new unit. And it was my error that I hadn't communicated that to the manager. And the manager's error was not understanding what my objectives were with that property and, and uh, not really understanding what I wanted from the property uh, and what my policy on expenses were. So that, that was not necessarily an, an unethical situation, but it was still a mismatch in, in management or a bad management relationship. Not that the manager did a bad job, but the relationship wasn't working because we hadn't gone through those questions and answers, right? But sometimes, and this has happened to me, I've had a manager that was not doing a good job, just a terrible, terrible manager. And I want you to look for, if these things happen to you, these are big red flags that you need to uh, you know, get some help or really dig into your manager to, to see what's going on. Um, some ways that managers steal from you is they can give a rent credit to the tenant for fixing a repair and then billing the owner for that same repair. Well, that's like one bill and two payments and people who are not good at accounting aren't going to necessarily recognize that the rent was debited and there was an expense as well. Sometimes the manager can duplicate expenses over multiple months where here's a legitimate invoice for a repair in September. And then, oh, by the way, in November, here's that same invoice again. And they take it out of your rent for two different months. It could be that's an innocent mistake, or it could be a way for a manager to be stealing money from you and you not, not know it. Um, collecting management fee on a tenant security deposit. This has happened to me and I pitched a fit, you know, because their accounting department just saw revenue and they put a management fee on that entire revenue, but it's not all the same. The tenant security deposit is not income and there's no management fee on that deposit because I have an obligation to pay it back. Uh, sometimes, and I, you know, being in my position as a, as a counselor, uh, I get people telling me all their horror stories about investing and not all investing, you know, has to be horrible, right? Some people who have a stamina for this, they, they just kind of laugh and like, oh, that's a good one. I've got another story I can go tell my investor friends uh, next time they hang out. Some people, it just you know, affects them emotionally. And then I steer them towards more, you know, commercial tenants or triple net tenants or real estate syndications or having an active partner where maybe one person is the passive partner, deals with the money and the other person is the active partner that deals with the, the management of the asset, et cetera. Um, I've heard stories where the manager collects rent and they tell the owner it's vacant, or maybe they fudge the move out date, right? Oh, your tenant moved out, but they moved out, you know, on, on the, the 20, you know, they moved out on the first, but they told you that they moved out, you know, a week earlier and the manager gets to pocket that extra rent. Here's a really big one that is straight up illegal that a lot of brokers don't actually know, right? And it's commingling funds in a broker's trust account. That means um, your money that comes from the tenant, but it belongs to you, that goes into the broker's trust account. If the broker makes some money in his own portfolio or he gets a, a, a commission check or something like that, they're not legally allowed to put those funds into the same account because they're mixing their personal funds with your, your funds. So I would ask, you know, just as a, a, a leading question, ask a broker what their policy is on maintaining their broker trust account. And if they just kind of look at you glassy eyed, then you know that that's a clue. They might not have the experience that you want. Um, sometimes a broker will collect the deposit at move in, and they're going to hold the deposit. And then when the tenant moves out, the tenant wants their deposit back. And the broker says to the owner, well, you are have the deposit because we gave it to you when the tenant moved in. And now we're going to deduct it from your, your rent, et cetera. And that's a, a sneaky one because sometimes people forget who's holding the deposit. Is the broker have it or do I have it, right? Because the lease sometimes doesn't say, right? The lease might say the deposit is $1,000, but the lease doesn't say who's holding it. Is it the owner? Is it the broker? So this is a, a sneaky one. And sometimes it could be innocent and sometimes it could be malicious. But as an owner, you're going to want to know very clearly who's holding the deposit. 
I like when I see my property management statements on a monthly basis, it just reminds everyone that the broker is holding the deposit for that tenant. And if the broker is balancing their broker trust account, then it's going to be obvious who's holding the, the, the deposit. Um, and, you know, this is a sad one, but sometimes property managers bill owners for repairs that didn't, didn't happen, right? And so uh, here's some red flags. If you see these red flags, right? I just showed you that the, the dishonest tricks that a property manager could use. Here's some red flags that those tricks are being used against you, right? If the manager is using the same service company for every repair, right? That's a red flag. The, you know, the same company that does your HVAC should not also do your plumbing and your painting and your carpeting and your window repair and your landscaping, right? Those are different skills. And so you're going to want an invoice from each of those companies, right? If you're not getting those invoices, that's a red flag. Your property manager should be giving you your invoices or maybe having a Dropbox, an online Dropbox where they put those invoices so you can go look at them when they want. Um, if the income and expense statements are vague or Ill illegible, right? If you don't understand your income and expense statement, call your manager, have them explain it to you. If they can't explain it to you, big red flag, right? Sometimes when your property is vacant, you're going to have utility and landscaping expenses, right? So if you've got 30 days vacancy and you never see the utility bill or the landscaping bill, that's an interesting red flag because maybe your property isn't really vacant. Maybe there's a tenant paying rent there and the manager's just pocketing the rent because if the tenant's still in the property, the utilities are going to be in their name and they're going to be paying for the landscaping, et cetera. Um, a big red flag, obviously, if you're getting notices from the neighbors, the HOA, the city, et cetera. Um, I've tried it both ways. Sometimes when I own a property, I'll communicate with the neighbors and say, hey, look, I'm the property owner. Here's the business card for my manager. If you have a problem, call my manager. If you can't reach the manager, I've, I've writ written my number on the back of the card as a, uh, a courtesy to the neighbor so that they feel empowered if there's a problem at the property that they have someone to talk to. Jason, you want to talk about best practices? Do you think that's a good idea to be in communication with your neighbors or not? Oh, uh, no, I think that's great. Uh, the neighbors, they are, especially if they're owners or if they have a mortgage, they they tend to feel higher up in the hierarchy when in reality we're all renting from somebody unless you completely pay for your house. But those neighbors are going to watch your property like a hawk if you give them that, that sense of empowerment. And that they're there 24-7. So... You know, that is a great tool uh, to have a neighbor two or three uh, watching that property, you know, at any given time and, you know, calling you to, you know, sometimes it can be bothersome because you could get that nosy neighbor, but still, it's better to uh, have too much information than, than none at all. Yeah, for example, one time I had a, uh, a, a water leak in one of my properties and the tenant was out of town. And the water was running down the street and the neighbor called me and they said, David, I just want to let you know that there's water coming out of your front door. And I'm like, well, thank you very much for calling. And then I could call my property manager and say, the neighbor called me and let me know this is a problem. The manager went out there, fixed the problem and, you know, no, no problem. Um, so that kind of eyes on the property can be very, very helpful. Um, your manager should be giving you before and after photos of the property. And if they tell you that it's inconvenient for them to do so, they are not the right manager for me, right? It's so easy today with smartphones, right? Just for the manager to take their smartphone, take a picture and email or text it to me. And it doesn't have to be a big fancy presentation. It can literally be a text message with the photo of the property. I also like, I've been very impressed when a manager had a service person go take care of the uh, HVAC at the property. You know that needed some the the cool condenser unit needed some servicing, and when they went into the property, they just took a few pictures. All right, not of the air conditioner, but just of the general condition of the property, 
And then they provided those to uh, me as the owner. And I thought that was really above and beyond service. That was really awesome. I got to look into my property just to, as a baseline to know what it looked like, right? Um, also, you were entitled to have a copy, a signed copy of the lease agreement and any kind of renewals or extensions of the lease, right? If you don't have those, I really encourage you to get them. In a, most states, the tenant signs the lease and the property manager countersigns the lease. And that's a really kind of a scary thought for a moment because your property manager has entered into a binding legal contract on your behalf as the owner. And I want to know what my property manager committed me to because they literally committed me to do something. And it that thing that I committed to is in the lease. Also, I want a written management agreement because that spells out what the manager is authorized to do on my behalf. The broker license thing is really interesting. Um, in every state that I'm aware of, to manage real estate for other people for a fee, you need to have a real estate broker's license, not just a salesperson's license, not a real estate agent's license, but a real estate broker's license. And the difference is kind of like between a difference between a doctor and a nurse, right? A nurse can do practice medicine under the supervision of a doctor. But if the nurse wants to just open their own medical practice and start doing their own things, that's not usually allowed, right? Depending on what the, the medical thing is. And that's the same idea with, um, with real estate. Um, whenever your tenants move in or out of the property, there's an inspection form or there should be, and your manager should be giving you a copy of that. And I make sure that I maintain that in my copy of the, uh, the documents, you know, I wish Jason very long and happy, healthy life. But if for some reason he, he had an unexpected departure from planet earth, I want to know where all my documents are so that I can transition smoothly to a new manager. Um, when there's irregular distribution dates of your money, that means the manager doesn't really have organizational procedures. They don't know what they're doing on certain days of the month and how to run their, their business. That's a red flag to me. If um, one day I get my money on the 10th, the next day it's the 15th, the next day it's the 20th, the next day it's the 12th. It should be fairly regular when you get your money. Um, if your tenants pay late, your manager should let you know. You know, usually an email is sufficient for, for me. Hey, your, man, your tenants are running late. I want my manager to recognize that they, there's a problem and that they're on top of it. Um, fair housing practices, this is such a big one. And the laws change from state to state. And really one of the reasons I really like investing in Texas is Texas is a much more landlord friendly state than where I live in the state of California. California is very landlord unfriendly. Jason, you want to talk about fair housing and how as a manager you comply with fair housing in the state of Texas? Well, we here in Texas and it's like this in a lot of other places as well. I mean, we cannot discriminate against, you know, race, religion, uh, familial status, things like that. Uh, so, I mean, if we did, that could bring about liability not only to us but to our owners. Uh, but what we we take uh, we take continuing education uh, just to stay up on on the fair housing laws so that our owners don't have to worry about that. And I mean, that, that alone, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very big deal. I mean, it can cause a lot of problems. I mean, it, they can come in and shut our entire company down, pull the broker's license and, you know, no, everybody's without a manager. Uh, so yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's a huge deal. Let me give you some very, very innocent examples of why fair housing is so tricky and why it's so important to have a man, a professional managing your property. So Jason, I'm going to be the bad landlord manager and you get to be the innocent tenant who's out to sue me. Ready? Okay. So, uh, Jason, um, I think this is a great property cause it's just one block away from the Catholic church. 
Do you think that's a great asset for this property? Do I think that's what? <laughs> Which wouldn't you like to live here? Because it's right next to the Catholic Church. Um, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Right? Uh, yeah. Which, which which role was I again? Um, <laughs> yeah, you get to be the yeah, uh, the, the the. So the other thing, I'm, I'm the tenant. You're the tenant. Yeah. Uh, I could also say, yeah, uh, oh, Jason, are you going to be living here with your wife and kids? Uh, no, you can't say that. Um, <laughs> what no, about? That's a no no. It isn't, right? It's a problem. Or how about, oh, you're going to love living here because you're Hispanic and this is a really Hispanic neighborhood. Yeah, you're going to lose your company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, Things that are very, are big, big no -nos. very, very innocently, you can violate fair housing and not, not know it. And so a manager takes continuing education and they're really hypersensitive to frame their words in such a way to comply with fair housing. Um, other signs that your manager is not a good one, um, they stretch the truth when it doesn't matter, right? For example, if I said, um, hey, is my property rent ready? Is, is, the, is it ready to go? Everything's ready and it's marketed? And if the manager says yes, and what they really meant is it's going to be ready tomorrow, that's a problem with me because it, I wouldn't care whether they said it's done today or it's going to be done tomorrow. But if they tell me it's done today, I expect it to be done today. You know, once upon a time, I fired a manager because I said, oh, you know what? A week ago, I asked you to remove some debris from the front yard. Was it done? And they said, yeah, it was done. I said, well, I'm standing in the yard right now and I see the debris that you were supposed to remove. Are you still going to tell me that you removed it? And they said, yes. I removed it I'm like, well, I'm looking at the debris. This is a, a not that the debris was a problem, but it was a, a, an honesty problem that uh, they, they couldn't just say, well, I'm, I was about to get to it or I forgot. Property managers aren't perfect. Don't expect your manager to be perfect, but I want them to have personal accountability when there's an error. And if your manager never, ever, ever gives you bad news, that's problematic uh, as well. So we're going to move along. Do's and don'ts of firing your property manager. The big one is find a new manager first. Give your manager written notice that you're leaving. Check your management agreement to see what kind of, uh, what your agreement, how you handle that transition. Sometimes there's a fee for departing. Sometimes you aren't. Take responsibility that the person that you're firing is the person that you hired. So you as an owner, you can't put all the blame on the manager right? It's partly your fault for hiring that manager in the first place. Things that you don't want to do, uh, don't go bad mouth your old manager to your new manager because your new manager is going to think that you're a pain to work with. Things that you could do is to say, one thing that really didn't work in my last property management relationship was that my statements never came on, you know, on the 10th of the month. And your new man, and I'm looking for a manager who can deliver their payment and the statements on the 10th of the month. Jason, is that something that you can do? So in that context, I, I kind of shared what I didn't like about the old manager with, but by spinning it into a positive saying, I've got an expectation that I'd like for you, uh, like to, to meet. The other thing is whatever you tell your tenant, your tenant's going to tell your old manager and your new manager. So just be mindful of what you tell your tenants. And we're almost to the end. We've got four property management secrets. One, be a good owner so that your manager will go the extra mile for you. Jason, I know that you would love to say that you treat all of your owners exactly the same, but I'm guessing that's impossible. Is that right? That's correct. I would love to, I would love to say that, that uh, I don't have favorites, but uh, I do. And it's strictly because of my, that they treat me. Yeah. So the cheapest, whatever it is, cheapest brain surgeon, the cheapest property manager, whatever, it doesn't save you money. When I'm looking for a manager, I want to make sure that they are very good and that they are earning enough money that they're going to take care of my property. And when they have to choose where to allocate their time, 
Are they going to put it on my portfolio or are they going to put it on someone else's portfolio? And it comes down to how well did I treat them? Do I respect them? Or do I treat them like a peer rather than as a servant? And a lot of people look at their property managers as servants because sometimes they do very hands-on uh, work. And that isn't true. They're your number one asset. You treat your manager like gold and they'll treat you well. Um, the other thing is make sure your whatever market you choose to buy a property in, make sure that it has a lot of management choices. When, when I was a very new investor, I bought a property in a very small town and there were only two property managers. One of them I really didn't like and the second one I hired and then had a conflict and I fired them and then I was stuck. Well, there were only two managers and I don't like them both. And what do I do now? So that's one reason I gravitate towards larger towns. A town like Dallas, Fort Worth has thousands and thousands of quality property managers. I mean, Jason's the best, but if for some reason we ever got into a disagreement, I'm sure that I could, within a matter of days, find another super high quality manager that keeps me honest, right? And it keeps Jason honest, right? He's going to do a great job for me because he knows there's another choice. Also, I really use property managers to help me find property to buy. And Jason knows all the time, whenever I'm looking at a new property in, in Dallas or whether I'm going to decide to develop something, I'll send him the address and say, Jason, what do you think of this property? Tell me what kind of rent you think you can get. Do you think this is a good property uh, area that would attract a lot of tenants? And would you like to own this property? And just yesterday, Jason was telling me of an off-market deal. Jason, you want to comment on how you would get access to off-market deals? Well, we have obviously several owners in our in our uh, in our company, uh, and you know, there. I guess there's a misconception that every investor is a bazillionaire, and they're not. They're normal Joes. I mean, most of them, uh, and sometimes they get over their head. In a property, and we have uh, one particular uh, client that is in that situation, and she reached out to me and said, "Jason, uh, here's my property. You know, we we have a tenant in it." And she said, "You know, if I could just get what I owe on this property, I'd get rid of it." So here we have a property that. You know, is is the owner is willing to sell it well below market, uh, and, and those come along all the time. Uh, it's just because our owners aren't all you know wealthy people. They're they just made an investment that got the best of them. Yeah, and, and so sometimes the problem isn't even the property, it's the owner. You know, I had one client who was telling me about their property and it was such a problem. And I, well, it's positive cash flow every month. What's the problem? Well, you see, I lost my job. And so I take all the rent money and I spend it to live on. Well, the problem isn't the property. The problem is you. If you paid the mortgage, you'd have, you know, money left over. And so people make mistakes. And what happens is the first person to know about it is usually the property manager. So great secret, work with your property manager to help you find deals or evaluate deals, etc. cetera. Um, this has been a great event. We're at the end of our hour together. Really would like to point out some great features of our website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. We've got some great investment opportunities available, real estate investment opportunities. We have a monthly online property showcase. Our next one is coming up and I really encourage you to uh, attend. We've got some investor training ideas. Um, all of those things are free on our website. Uh, please check it out. And really thank you so much for attending today's event. If you'd like to get a hold of Jason or myself, our contact information is on the screen. And I hope you have a fantastic and prosperous investing experience. And if you set it up correctly, it can be hassle-free.